Tereshenko was a special needs advisory teacher, um, in, moved into teacher training where she was a specialist in helping uh, teachers learn about children with specific learning difficulties, dyslexia included. And then four years ago, she was appointed uh, as education director of the British Dyslexia Association. Um, she will tell you more about that herself, but uh, the BDA has a very wide-ranging um, kind of remit with dyslexia. Uh, it is, its aim is to, first of all, to promote the uh, well-being of dyslexic individuals of all ages, and they work very hard in all kinds of ways across the country um, to achieve that aim. Uh, they're not involved directly in teaching or in teacher training, but they are, have been instrumental in setting standards for people who run courses on dyslexia, ourselves included, uh, which, in, which insists that people running courses on dyslexia work to the same criteria, work to the same aims, um, and ensure uh, a really good professional training. So the BDA has helped us all in that respect and in many others, and it's very good to have her here with us today and also Aaron Smith, who is project officer for a project running this year and possibly um, in the future called Dyslexia on the Move. So you will see their van parked outside the front door with a great kite on it saying BDA Dyslexia. So Kate is wearing today um, her Dyslexia and Creativity hat. She has many hats. <laughs> uh, and it's very good to... Um, that she can be with us because she is passionate about giving dyslexia, uh, about giving dyslexic youngsters and dyslexic people of all ages the opportunities to, do, to develop in the best ways that they can. And I think Alan Fred's um, remarks about this has set this up for us very well. And so we look forward to seeing, to hearing what Kate has to say. And may I say that we have had, of course, in Bangor, long association with the BDA. Tim Miles was a founding member in 1972, so the BDA has passed its own 40th birthday. In Bangor, our School of Psychology this year is having its 50th birthday. And next year um, will be the 40th year since the dyslexia unit was set up to provide um, a structure for, from which we could go out into schools and teach children for local education authorities. So we have some in anniversaries coming up. Watch this space. So now, Kate, if you would like to come, and we will, I will shut up and let the most important part of the day get along. Thank you. Morning. And um, how very nice to be here on this nice sunny day. I'm delighted um, to be in Bangor. It is a place which is synonymous with the history of dyslexia. Professor Miles, of course, was a giant in this field. Um, and still, the research that has been done has echoes of the work that he started all those years ago. So, for example, I have just come from two days of a neurology conference at Oxford University. People from all around the world showing the results of... Um, brain imaging, um, work that they've been doing, working with dyslexics and non-dyslexics, um, clearly showing that there are brain differences that can be seen when dyslexics and non-dyslexics are doing written language tasks, but also even in the brains of children who are at risk of dyslexia because there is a family pattern, even as infants, so even before they get to the stage where they're doing written language tasks, it is possible to see the differences in the brain functioning. And of course, one of Professor Miles' early pieces of research that was very uh, significant in this field was to do with post-mortems and looking at the structural differences in dyslexic brains and non-dyslexic brains um, and seeing, for example, that there are more connections between the two hemispheres in dyslexics, that there are differences in the language side of the, the um, brain in the, in the, insofar as that dyslexic brains tend to be more um, symmetrical whereas non-dyslexic brains tend to specialise more in language activity in the left hemisphere. So th the history um, and the tradition of the work that was started here is still resonating now across the world. Um, so it's a, it's a privilege as well as a pleasure to be here um, in Bangor today. Um, 
And, and from the BDA point of view, but also from a personal point of view, I would like to take the opportunity to say thank you to the Bangor Dyslexia Centre for the work that they do and they continue to do, training teachers um, to help dyslexic pupils, but also in assessing. Um, I was assessed for my dyslexia as a first year student at university. I struggled to get into university, I had to do retakes, was terrified I was going to be thrown out at the end of the first year. Um, and was fortunate to go to university at Aston, where there was a lady called Dr. Margaret Newton, who some of you may recall from the Aston Index. She was a contemporary of Professor Miles. Um, and in those days, all of the essays were written. I gave in my first essay in handwriting. And uh, she took one look at it and said, I think you'd better come and see me for an assessment. So I did. Um, and she was marvelous. She diagnosed my dyslexia, and she said, some, some really important things to me. She said, first of all, you're clever enough to meet university, about which I had considerable doubt. Um, secondly, your brain works in a different way. And then she said, we need you to work in this field. I was a first year undergraduate psychology student. She said, we need you to work in this field because your brain makes connections that our brains cannot extraordinary woman she was, very inspirational. And then she tutored me. She tutored me in study skills, revision techniques. She enabled me to pass my first year exams, to carry on then to do teacher training and a PhD and everything else that has followed since. So I am a, a great believer in the value of centers such as the one here that do assessment work and train teachers. This is really life-changing stuff. And and, and I think it's, on a very personal level, of course, it's easy to see, for me, to understand the importance of it. But for society as well, you know, that, that, that as a society, if we believe that it is important to give every individual the chance to fulfill their potential, then this is what we need to be doing. And we need to be doing it consistently. We need to, to leave behind the discussion of whether dyslexia exists or it doesn't. It does exist, and we can prove it. That, 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 that argument is dead in the water. There is endless, endless, really good scientific research now with the tools that we have to show really clearly that it does exist. Uh, and we need, as a society, to enable these individuals to reach their potential. So today, um, I'm not going to talk much about the research because I've, I've I've entitled this A Personal Perspective, but I couldn't help uh, pinching from this conference I've just been at, um, this particular study, which was uh, on a poster at the conference. Um, and it was a, a French um, research team, and they were looking at uh, creativity in secondary school pupils, dyslexics versus non-dyslexics. And they used a creativity test, which involves things such as you have a particular shape, uh, let's say, sort of an egg shape or a brick, or, and, and you um, ask them to come up with as many different um, uh, designs and drawings that you could put that into as possible. Um, so there were some tests that were to do with um, uh, the fluency, how many different ideas you could come up, some to do with the breadth of the ideas that you could come up with. Um, and then they, that scored up. And what they found, uh, which won't surprise those of us who work with dyslexics, is that the dyslexics were more able to produce this variety and fluency in creative thinking than the non-dyslexic pupils in those secondary schools. Um, they were then, because this was a neurology uh, conference, they were then speculating about why this is. And whenever you look at the, dif the brain differences in dyslexics and non-dyslexics, there is always a little piece, it's usually at the end of the talk, and it's usually a throwaway line, and it, it goes like this. And what was quite interesting was that we also noticed that the structure enabled more connections. And this is at the cellular level. So, so you'll be familiar probably with Professor Stein's work about magnocellular processing. So that in the visual system and the auditory system, dyslexics have differences in that there are, there are two types of main cells, the magno cells and the parvo cells. And dyslexics have fewer magno cells, and there are disruptions in the processing. But what they were um, um, 
uh, postulating is that, that there is also, within those differences, the capacity for making more connections. So this may be a compensatory um, aspect, and it may be to a certain extent that where dyslexics are able to be more creative, it's because at a structural level, the brain enables them to make more connections. Um, also, in terms of, of um, observation and anecdote, uh, many people have, have observed over the years that there are high numbers of dyslexics in creative subjects. So in art schools, for example, um, it has been um, reported for many years that there are high numbers of dyslexics in things like design. They tend to be quite good at 3D thinking, problem solving, creative thinking, um, engineering. Um, one of the things we used to do with Margaret Newton in, in the consultancy years ago um, we used to have a clock on the wall, which was one of those old-fashioned wind-up clocks. I say wall, it was a mantelpiece. Old-fashioned wooden wind-up clock, which used to break down variously. And um, every time it broke down, Margaret would say, don't worry, there's an eight-year-old boy coming who's dyslexic. He'll fix it for us. And every time, they did. They came in, and while she was interviewing the parents, the child fixed the clock. This ability to be able to think in 3D and see how things fit together. So. But typically, one of the questions we would ask, you know, what did the child like doing when they were younger? Were they good at Lego? Well, why were we asking? Because we were recognizing that there tends to be an ability with this 3D thinking. Um, there is also research around dyslexia and entrepreneurism. So we know that there are more successful entrepreneurs who are dyslexic than, than there are dyslexics in the general population. It's particularly the case in America interestingly, even more so than here. And it's quite interesting to speculate about why that might be. Perhaps in America, the culture enables failure more. Perhaps the culture is more that if you fail, you get up and you try again and again and again and again. Perhaps over here, we're a bit harsher on, on people who fail, and perhaps they, they don't feel so ready to, to get up and try again and again. Um, now, you may say, well, dyslexics possibly uh, become entrepreneurs because it's difficult for them to have the um, uh, educational exams, pass um, entrance exams to get into the more structured um, uh, company type uh, employment. And of course, this may be part of it. But, but I do believe that there is also an aspect, which is that if you are dyslexic and you have survived the education system, you have been able to do things every day which are virtually impossible. And in order to do that, you have had to think around the situation just to survive. I'll give you an example. One of my earliest memories at primary school is of um, the teacher had a set of flashcards, with, and there was a, a, a word to read on each flashcard. Um, and it was the same set that we had on re repeated sessions. And I remember the teacher was sat on the chair, and we were all sat on the floor. It must have been quite young. Um, and she would have this session. And every time it started, I think, mm, yeah, am I going to do this? Because I couldn't read the words. And um, so she would hold up the flashcard. Now, what I did was that I observed the children around me and the answers they gave, basically. So I learned over the sessions that there was a particular card that went up that was long and thin. And I learned to link the long and thin card with the word that was the right answer that the other children gave. There was a particular card that had a bend in one corner. So I linked that to the right answer that the other children gave. There were cards that were slightly different colors of gray. So I linked that to those words. But there was one particular word, which there was another boy in the class who really struggled. And he only knew one word. And so I knew that when his hand went up, it was that particular word. So when his hand went up, my hand went up, uh, because I knew it must be that. And then there were various other different aspects of guessing that went on. There were certain words that I knew. Uh, I, I could tell sort of perhaps what the first sound was. And there were maybe three words that seemed to start with that kind of sound. So I maybe had a one in three chance of being right with those. So what was happening there was that I was using, actually, a lot of learning strengths. I was using what I would call video memory. I was using color. I was using shape. I was using remembering uh, real life situations 
and the resound was part of that. What I wasn't being able to do was remember the look of that row of symbols. Symbols in order? No. Still, with things like the cash point, I can't remember my cash point number, but it's four digits, and my memory for symbols breaks down after about, mm, well, three is a bit inconsistent, two is fairly safe. Um, and so what do I do? I chunk. I do the same two digits, and then another two digits, and then I'm only dealing with two symbols in a row, and then my, my memory can cope with it. Memory for symbols is very difficult for dyslexics, as we know. Um, my old cash point number is this. I don't know what the numbers are, but I know it's that. And this, of course, is a way that dyslexics learn quite often. Talking, talking about the prowess in sport, for example, you can have dyslexics who are excellent at that kind of genius, which is about motor memory and motor ability and sporting ability. Um, and they will be able to remember through their motor, motor memory how to kick a goal, for example. Um, and, and this is why, of course, in the teaching, we use a lot of multisensory methods. And very exciting. Um, there was a, a, a couple of people at this conference in the last two days talking about computer games and how computer games can help dyslexics. Um, of course, we have in the teaching, we have things like Word Shark and Nessie and those sorts of things that we've used for years to help dyslexics with their learning. It's well structured, you know, phonics based, good teaching principles under, underpinning them and all of those sorts of things. But what's quite interesting now is that you have with the tablets and things, you have this touch element that's coming in. So there is more of an opportunity to link it with physical touch. And we have in the dyslexia friendly schools um, really good examples of where these are being used. So for example, um, in woodwork classes where um, uh, videos are being made by the tutor of how to do a particular wood joint, for example, and then they're being put on the tablets and the dyslexic individual can go and choose the picture of the joint from an array and then go into it and that shows the video with sound of how to put this joint together. Really good use of technology going on now. Anyway, I digress. I do that quite a lot. I've noticed. Um, and of course, the other, the other uh, thing about um, dyslexia and creativity is that all of us know dyslexics who are creative. Now, I will, I will um, classify this as I'm not saying that all dyslexics are creative geniuses. I am not Leonardo da Vinci. No, but, um, and there are variances between dyslexics. Dyslexic individuals are individuals. They are all different. Um, not all of them will have an artistic bent. Um, not all of them will be good 3D thinkers or be able to kick a, kick a goal in rugby. But what I'm saying is that I do believe, and I, I really do believe, that the field should be looking at dyslexic ability at least as much as it is looking at dyslexic disability. Because in the teaching, how often are we using the abilities? We're teaching to the strengths. We're understanding the weaknesses, and we're understanding how we have to overcome them. But very often, we're teaching to the strengths. And I think we really need to stop being shy about, being talking, about talking about what dyslexics are good at and what they can do. Um, this is from a dyslexia-friendly school it was um, a PowerPoint produced by a primary school, produced by one of the teachers, and it was to show in Dyslexia Awareness Week, which is usually in the autumn term. Um, and uh, so she put this up and she said to the children, uh, what do these people all have in common? <coughs> so here we have my particular favorite, um, and Kira, and Walt Disney. And by that now, the children were starting to say, is it to do with films? You know, they're all in films. Um, and then television. This is quite a nice one because she said, said yes, do you, do you know this chap and he's in, in Dragon's Den? Do you see Dragon's Den? Um, Self-made entrepreneur, billionaire, um, uh, very dyslexic as a child. And, um, and of course now encourages other people to set up um, in an entrepreneurial way. Leonardo da Vinci famously signed his name backwards, did a lot of mirror writing, as did Einstein. Interesting, when Einstein was young and, and uh, unable to learn a sound letter correspondence, his parents were told to put him in a school for um, uh, unintelligent 
individuals, mentally retarded individuals. Fortunately, his father thought that was a bad idea. Um, and yet when he subsequently grew up, of course, he, he, his route wasn't a normal one academically. He was working as a clerk when he wrote his two seminal works on uh, um, theories of relativity. And I don't think it's any coincidence that, that, that basically that says that time, as I understand it, time is not constant. You ask any dyslexic whether they think time is constant. I don't think time is constant. I think an hour in the morning is much longer than an hour in the afternoon. It is, isn't it? Isn't it? Apparently it's not, it's not about that, the theory of relativity. It's about things bending in space and such. But, um, uh, but I don't think that's any, any uh, coincidence. Neither is it any coincidence that those seminal papers had no references at the end of them. You wouldn't have read them. Genius, you see. Creativity, making connections other people can't make. And when he got to be um, uh, at university, um, and they gave him his own room to work in, and it was a round room with a blackboard all the way around, and he wrote, he did complete mirror, all his, his equations, he did complete mirror writing all the way around the room. Um, and people would look at it and say, gosh, he's genius, he's got his own code. This man's got his own code, wasn't it? It was mirror writing. Um, but this is really interesting, I think. You see, you get the young child who is struggling. How do we interpret what they're doing? And how much of it is about what they're doing? How much of it is about our interpretation? Anyway, there's another one, Hans Christian Hansen. Um, ugly duckling turns into a beautiful swan, has great trouble in young years. Um, Steven Spielberg. Again, great um, creative brain in the film industry. Thomas Edison, inventor of the light bulb, um, who famously ran out of, of um, money in his uh, research lab. Um, but he could see in his mind's eye, he knew that this thing was possible. And so his staff worked on without pay for a couple of months, and, and they did indeed invent the light bulb. Um, and this is from him. Genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. One thing about being dyslexic is nothing comes easy. Um, and so there is this thing about persistence. If, if at first you don't succeed, try, try, and try again. Um, and often in the teaching, um, I would say to the children, always believe in your ability. It's a really important thing. Always believe in your ability because there are so many times when it is so tough that you really could just give up. And the, the important thing I think there is to have somebody in your background who believes in you. And now, sometimes it's a parent, sometimes it's a teacher. I suspect that person is everybody in this room. Um, and, uh, and that I know, there were times in my educational career where I might have given up, except that I knew that there were teachers and my parents who believed in my ability. Um, my English teacher, I did A-level English. Bad idea. It's a very bad idea. Um, and uh, failed it and had to retake it. Um, and my A-level English teacher, bless him, actually cried. He actually cried real tears. And he said, it's not fair. It's not fair. You've got the ability. And then in the exam, you know, to come out with nothing. But I knew then that he believed that I had ability. And so that kept me going. This is um, from a little book, Charles Dickens' book, that was left to me by my grandfather. Um, he was a, a delightful man um, who had great difficulty learning. Uh, he was a, a food inspector. And in order to become a food inspector, he had to pass various exams. And he and my grandmother, as part of their courtship, used to spend hours <coughs> walking around woods and she would read things out to him, and he would say them out loud. And that's how he learned for his exams. Um, and, and he left me this book. It's a beautiful little book. It's that big. Um, and it's leather bound. And it's um, um, Charles Dickens, The Battle of Life. And there's an inscription on it, which is this. Which is, um, it says, he was from London. It says, life ain't holding the good cards. It's playing a bad hand well. Now, many of us would dispute whether being dyslexic is a bad hand, but I understand the spirit of what it says. The spirit of what it says is that you have what you have, and, and 
One thing that nobody can do is change. No, actually, that's not even true. You can change brain structure. You can change it through good teaching. You can change it through good teaching. And you can make new connections through good teaching. But the fact of the matter is, if you're born dyslexic, you are dyslexic. Whether you have good teaching and you end up what they call a well-compensated dyslexic or not, essentially, dyslexia is with you for life. You can, you know, you can find ways around it, but it's there for life. Um, one of the lovely things with the dyslexia-friendly schools is that there is, is part of this whole school approach is to encourage children to have a, good, a positive self-belief. And this might be encouraging their creative abilities, for example. It might be um, during Dyslexia Awareness Week having examples of their work up, for example, you know, and, and allowing them to do things like role play and videoing instead of having to write things down, show their ability in those different areas. Um, and this is from one of the children in one of those schools. And um, it says, uh, Dyslexia rocks. That's a uh, nice child's way of saying it. But what she's basically saying is, I feel positive about being dyslexia about being dyslexic, and I think that's a really important thing. It's important to, be, to feel positive about who you are. Um, so this is just me wanting to say thank you to those of you who are in the room who support dyslexics, because it really matters, and it makes a difference. And I know that good teachers, in the way that they support dyslexics, it's absolutely at the heart of what they do to build on the positives of that individual, to see the ability in them to draw on that and to encourage that individual to, to use their strengths. Um, and cope, what, what I'd like to say about it is that I do believe that there are abilities in dyslexics and I think it's really important to understand that, to increase self-esteem but also because if you understand as a dyslexic what your strengths are, you have ways of overcoming. So, let me give you some examples. Um, I know, for example, that my memory for symbols in a row breaks down after two, so I know to chunk things. But I also know that I can apply that in different situations and use my learning strengths. So, for example, I can use my understanding of how, of, of real life situations, um, and put those two things together. If I am doing something which is an organizational task, I know that if I try to do it in chunks of more than two, I'm likely to lose some, I'm likely to forget some. So I have strategies. I have lists, I have Outlook, I have um, loads of different electronic type reminders. Uh, but essentially, there is a part of me, part of that process, which is saying, I know I can do all these things, I know I will be able to do all of these things, but I'm only going to be able to do them if I do them in units of two. And so I will do two things, and then I go on to the next two things. I don't set off trying to do four, because I will lose something somewhere along the way. Um, I know that I have a really good memory for seeing what's around me, what I call locus, place, okay? Um, and hearing things at the same time, and I can put that on a kind of a running video. So if I'm in a meeting, for example, and there are people from different organizations and they're talking about things, you know, um, I, I kind of, it's not a perfect memory, I don't say it is a perfect memory, but it's not far off for being able to play back what's been said in that situation, if I picture myself in that situation and play it back. So sometimes I'll get the minutes of meetings and I'll go through and it'll say, so-and-so said so-and-so, such and such. Oh, no, they didn't. And I know they didn't because I can see myself sitting in that room. I can see exactly what they're saying and I can hear it. And I can put it down almost word for word. So there are strengths that you can use. It's important to know what those are um, in daily life and, of course, in learning. Um, so... I worked for many years with Margaret Newton as a psychologist doing diagnostic assessments for dyslexia. And um, one of the things that we have to do is get the child to do a piece of writing and, and uh, analyze it in certain different ways. Um, and so I thought it would be really interesting to get them to do a piece of writing about how they learn. And so it, the, there was a conversation that went something like that. It's, 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 um, um, how do you learn? Can you think of a time 
when you've tried to learn something and it worked really well. And, and what were you doing? What helped you to remember? So you might have a teenage boy say, and you might say, well, I go go-karting. And when I go go-karting, I have to learn the track. And you say, OK, how do you remember it? And he says, well, what I do is I walk around it, and then it's as if I can imagine myself looking down at it like a bird. This is quite a typical dyslexic type answer. And so what he's doing is through that motor movement, he's building up a kind of a 3D map in his mind, and he can imagine himself sort of floating above it and walking around it. Okay? Very often, children come for assessment, and parents will say, well, he can't remember his spellings, but we only have to go somewhere once, and he can remember how to get there. So often you hear that. Because they have this really good memory for, they come to this junction and they remember that pub on the corner or whatever it is over here, and that he went that way, and what comes next. And so this visual memory is very strong. Anyway. Um, and so then I was sort of dig into that. Was, well, when you remember it, it's a color. Is, it, is moving part of what you remember about it? Is there sound? <coughs> Here's a chap then, he's 10. And this, is, this was his um, answer, how I learned. He says, I can memorize pictures, often really strong for dyslexics. And they're colored, again, a really strong memory anchor. I can video record in a way, and can almost memorize a whole play. Now that's extraordinary, isn't it? Here is a child who has come for assessment. Actually, he's been for assessment before he's come for review. But um, who's having difficulty learning spelling, and yet he can almost memorize a whole play. So that's what we need to be using in the way we're teaching him. And this is this Harry Chase deal thing, isn't it? You know, can you teach the way they learn? If they can't learn the way you teach, can you teach the way they learn? Um, we must memorize the whole play. And sound. His video has sound. Some of them don't have sound. His does have color. Some of them don't have color. And I can stick my thumbs up and make a B and D. That's B E D bed. Um, and when I'm photographing, interesting word he's using for his memory, when I'm photographing, I can picture the background, place, really important memory anchor for dyslexics. And I, I think this is significant because in the classroom, particularly with younger children in primary school, what do we do? We put them in a classroom and we teach them everything in that same classroom. And what you're doing there is that you have an opportunity with the dyslexic to give them a, mem a memory filing system, which is about things being in different places, Instead of which, you set them in the one place and you drop everything into the same folder. How are they supposed to be able to remember the difference from one thing to another when you put everything in the same folder? So there is this thing about taking them to a different place, not just a different part of the school, teach them a different thing. And then they can picture themselves being in that place and remember what happened in that place. Um, I picture the background. Sometimes I picture a scene, I look around for a split, diff a split second, I notice the difference, BD there, if there is one. So can you like that and tell you what's changed? Dyslexics are not people who cannot learn. Dyslexics are people who learn in a different way. Here's another one, he's just gone to uh, secondary school. Um, how I learn. When we did a science experiment, he's typed this. Uh, we first were told what we had to find out if ink was made up of one substance or two. I remember it by sort of video memory, and eight of it is stuck in my brain. So many dyslexics remember science because they can picture, they can play back their video of what the, the person actually did in front of them. Um, I can remember it in color, noise, what room I'm in, locus, 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 and movement, this physical doing, really important for dyslexics. And the most easiest way of remembering it is by it being fun. Um, it's also easy to remember by actually doing it. Physical doing, actually doing it. Notice the different spellings of remember variously there. I had a cunning plan when I was doing my GCSEs because I knew there were certain words I didn't know how to spell. I had a cunning plan that I would spell them a different time each, a different way each time. Because I figured then the exam, um, I had a, a better chance of getting one right. And the examiner might figure that the others were slips. I'm not sure this was very impressive to the examiner, I have to say. 
but, but I, I had no other way. I could not remember those strings of letters. Um, so, what I did was I extracted from what the children had said their learning strengths. What are their collective learning strengths? So, sometimes it is auditory memory. Memory for things like tunes, rhythms, rhymes, monomics, accents. So, doing something in a different place and acting it out with a different accent is, can be something that they can remember when they play back their video sometimes. Visual memory, particularly pictures with colour, with humour, with stories, with meaning. Um, tactile, I, uh, one child, in particular a statemented child I worked with some years ago, very severely dyslexic. Um, mother, mother was an uh, advisory teacher, brought him to me. And um, uh, he, was ha he was learning French. Yes, um, and the, they wanted him to learn French because it was in the family in the family and uh, because it's difficult the language is difficult and it's not a uh, transparent language and um, he was getting consistently about uh, about sort of naught out of ten each week for the spelling tests and I asked him how he learned and everything he was talking about was about it was to do with touching and moving I think that's really interesting so we got the wooden letters and put them on the floor and for his spelling his French spellings I had him close his eyes and touch now Often, the message from the eyes is confusing dyslexics. When I look at a page, the letters in the middle are much bigger than the letters at the side. I do have a visual stress effect. Some dyslexics have crowding, some have moving, some have reversing. What this means is that what the eyes give you is a mess. And you can't learn from a mess, and neither can you relate a mess to this thing that you see the next day and say that's the same. So sometimes the message from the eyes is what's making learning inconsistent. Um, and so it was with this boy. So we had him close his eyes and touch. Um, and all of a sudden, the next week, he got 9 out of 10 for his French um, test because the memory of the touch was reliable. His message was getting the right reliable um, information. Um, and his French teacher came to me, he said, it's a miracle, I've never seen anything like it. It's not a miracle at all. You just talk to the child, find out how they learn, and then do it in the way they learn. It's common sense. It's just common sense. Anyway, um, 3D thinking. So this wonderful thing you get with dyslexia is where they think about things from all angles, you know, um, uh, that they can be um, designers. So it is said that NASA insists on having dyslexics <coughs> on their research team. Why? Because they can think about things in space think about things from different angles. Um, and video memory, this making of a running video that you can then play back. Sometimes the strengths are in other things, this creative ability. But occasionally taste is a strong memory anchor. Sometimes smell, for some dyslexic smell. Um, I don't know who taught me. I know there was a lady who helped me to learn to read, and I remember two things about her. I remember that she pointed with her pen to the start of the word, for the word that I was on, and that was really helpful because it helped to the word for me. And I remember that she always wore perfume and always smelt really nice. Strange thing, strange thing, but those things I remember. Um, Tumour, stories, very um, important for dyslexics. Dyslexics have difficulty remembering a good story, as long as it makes sense and it has meaning then fine. And logic. So that's just often very logical. We don't forget that. So I think apart from this sort of problem-solving ability, um, I don't know if, if you uh, are familiar with an organisation called the Arts Success of Trust. Wonderful organisation. They've been encouraging um, artists who are dyslexic for many, many years. And um, uh, they had some activities that they, they invited their members to take part in years ago. And one of them was adding uh, one and one to make two. And the array of different answers they came up with was extraordinary. You had ones as uh, lying down on top of each other in 3D, um, in, um, in, in digital, in in numbers, as words, as you, you had every single different combination you could think of, you know, um, as, as numbers of bricks and all sorts of different things. Um, but uh, coming up with new ideas is, is one of the strengths that dyslexics do have. Um, empathy is on there. 
And I think that's an important one. I think that when individuals have struggled and they have felt the effects of stigma and prejudice, and both of those exist, I think it makes them more naturally understanding of other people who have difficulties, whatever those difficulties may be. And I do see it as one of the strengths of dyslexics, um, empathy for others and understanding. Um, when I was at secondary school, um, I went to, to what in those schools was called a grammar school, managed to just get into a grammar school. That my, my primary school teacher said they thought I would fly, fly through the test and I was surprised I didn't, I scraped in. And, um, but when I was in, five minutes left, just tell me. When I was in secondary school, in um, sixth form, it went over to being what was called a comprehensive school. And for the first time ever, we had a remedial teacher. She only came in at two mornings a week or something. Um, and there were only three children in the school who were bad enough to need a remedial teacher. And that was me and these two boys, who, looking back, I'm pretty sure, were dyslexic. And what they used to do was we, we used to go in the, have to go and play time um, for remedial lessons. Uh, of course, nobody knew about dyslexia then. She didn't know about dyslexia. The school didn't know about it. I didn't know about it. And what she used to do was she would give us a list of 10 difficult spellings, which were completely unconnected. And she would say, what I want you to do is learn these. So we would spend our play time looking at them as if that was going to help. Um, and then she should say, for your homework, I want you to practice them every day, practice learning them. So I used to go away and for my homework, I used to practice learning them every day, and then we'd go back at the start of the next lesson. We would have a test, and I would get two out of ten and get most of them wrong. And what had I learnt? I'd learnt that I couldn't do it. What I'd learnt? More than that, I'd learnt I couldn't do it, and she didn't know how to help me. There was nothing that she was doing that was helping so, what did I do? After about three or four lessons, I stopped going. And so, when we do work now with youth offenders, for example, been excluded, um, you know, um, stopped going to school. Of course they've stopped going to school. That's what any sane person would do. If they're in a class every day where you can't read, where you can't access, where, where you're being made to feel stupid, of course they stop going. Anyway, don't get me started. <laughs> Anyway, um, and, uh, but, but what was interesting was that my peers kind of assumed that I must be a bit stupid because I was having remedial lessons. They would call that remedial lessons. And so they started to treat me as if I must be stupid. Yes. Oh. If I, is, is that, that better? If I come closer? Okay. Um, so uh, they started to treat me as if I was stupid. And, and how this manifested itself is that if I spoke to them and I used a good piece of vocabulary, a puzzled look came over their faces. And they were clearly uncomfortable. And so I stopped doing it. I stopped using good vocabulary. And then they seemed much more comfortable. Oh, that seemed to work better. So I was becoming the person that their prejudice expected me to be. And it wasn't until after I was diagnosed at university and I had people around me saying, you are clever enough to be here and, and to give me the confidence and the skills to, to show that, that I gradually, even with those peers, started to show them that other side. So the stigma, it is there, it does exist, but it has a massive impact. Anyway, I must push on. So that, that was about NASA. That's about uh, seeing things as a jigsaw puzzle, you know, being able to put together the pieces. Dyslexia is genetic, we know this. I have three sons, guess what? Uh, <laughs> this is my middle son. Um, he's he's uh, a fabulous 3D thinker. When he was six, his teacher called me and she said, I'm terribly worried. And I said, why? What is it? What's the matter? She said, uh, it, it's his reading. Um, I said, really, why, 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 what's the problem? She said, well, well, he's holding his book upside down. He's reading it upside down and backwards. And I nearly said to her, what's the problem? 
but I thought, no, but she clearly was very worried. She was having sleepless nights, didn't know what to do, never seen anything like it, which is what they said about my spelling. Um, fortunately, of course, I had trained, particularly in early identification. And um, so the school, to their credit, let me go in and do one to one work with him. And we worked with the wooden letters and we, we anchored them on something solid. And he had monomics, you know, letter land and a Paul Peter with the, the, the ears that come and you, you anchor it to eating out of the person's hand and all of that sort of thing. I was delighted. I was delighted because I said to him, you have such potential. You are a really good 3D thinker. He was thinking about letters as objects. That's what he was doing. He was thinking them in the way that you would think about a chair. Is that a chair? Is that a chair? Right. P. I don't even know which way up. B, D, whatever it is. What difference does it make? If you think of it as an object, which way round it is, really doesn't matter. That's what he was doing. And I said to him, you're going to be fantastic. You know, it's going to help with art. It's going to help with engineering, being able to see. The, but please, when you're reading with your teacher, could you hold your book this particular way round? Because she can't do it upside down and backwards. When you read with me, if you want to do it upside down, that was fine. I still read upside down and backwards now if I'm a bit bored in a meeting. It doesn't bother me. But for him, um, in that situation, for the teacher to stop having sleepless nights, he had to do that particular way around. Anyway, this is him at 17 drawing. This is, he did this. This is a little sketch he did with pen. Um, so that's the kind of 3D thinking and ability. He's studying medicine now. He wants to be a surgeon. He'll be great because he'll be able to see in his mind's eye how things join up. Two minutes left, right? Um, so I think society <coughs> needs the creative ability of dyslexics. I think we should be celebrating and encouraging these abilities and benefiting from them. Um, and just, just about using the strengths. So colour, dyslexics and colour. So perception for colour is so much better often than perception for lines and where lines meet. So just as an example, here's a little chappy. He was 10. Um, and you see his writing on the top line. It's not a terribly good slide, but can you see how it's disjointed? This is visual perceptual. Uh, that he's having difficulty knowing where to meet the line, how to sit on the line. You've got this, this uneven sizing and such. Um, and he's put people wear glasses because they can't see properly. Their eyes are a bit fuzzy and blurry. When I grow up, I want to be a police person, I will be good. I want to work hard so I can earn some money and get some, buy some food and drinks. Very, very deprived background, this chappy. Anyway, and what I've done is, is noticing that there's that visual perceptual difficulty there, I've thought, right, we'll use colour because perception for damp colour is not damaged. And all I've done is taken um, a yellow highlighter pen put a ruler down and just done a highlighter pen yellow across that line. And then I've written what he's written up there. People wear glasses. He's written over the top of it to get the motor movement because motor is a learning strength for dyslexics. And then he's written that line underneath. So that's him writing that. Now that took about 15 minutes. But it's about understanding the strength for colour perception and building it into the teaching. And then you can use things like aggregate pictures. So this is uh, OA pictures. Um, so lots of different words that are spelt with OA are on this picture. And there's a story. It's about a goat and somebody who's having a moan and somebody who's, who's got a boat that, that's having a float and there's a goal and all sorts of things. So if somebody can't remember a series of symbols, but they can remember a picture, they can look on their OA picture, and if that word is on their OA picture, it's spelt with an OA. Yes? So you're using the strengths. Um, I do it with place as well. So if I need to remember things, I put them by the door, for instance. In my office sometimes, there are things that are by the door, because that's my memory anchor for remembering how to do them. You can use it for things like revision. So one of the things I was taught as an undergraduate by this wonderful Margaret Newton is how to use a picture journey to revise a list of things. So you think of a familiar <coughs> journey and you break it into different sections and at each point you make a humorous memory anchor between that point and that number on your list. So this is um, the Battle of Hastings, say 1066. So I might think of 
um, supposing it's, it's um, at home, that's the first place in my journey. I might think of, of um, uh, grandma being at home. I might think of a tank coming in through the front door and somebody running, and that's haste, being in haste. So it's the Battle of Hastings. It's anchored to my image of home. Um, and for the 1066, I might think of soldiers. I'm going to group it in two, because I know that's what works for me. I might think of a soldier standing upright and somebody else who's collapsed in a ball. That's the 10. And then I might think of two who've kind of, who are kind of humped over, like sleeping and kneeling down, like a, like a six shape, two like that. So for me, that would stick. That would stick because I have good memory for, for pictures and stories, um, whereas the series of symbols wouldn't. Um, we do need to teach dyslexics how to relax because the brain, one of the, the tricks that the brain um, does, and it's interesting, they're talking about things like dopamine and noradrenaline now as part of the, the dyslexic process. Um, but we must realise that being dyslexic is not a constant. You're not as dyslexic today as you will be tomorrow, sort of thing. It does depend um, on the amount of stress you're under, how tired you are, and particularly before exams, we, do, we teach the children relaxation techniques. This is one of our dyslexia-friendly colleges. Um, one of the tasks that their art department had was to produce um, uh, posters about dyslexia that went up all around. And it was wonderful, because here you have this lovely image, you know, the light bulb, which uh, invented by a dyslexic, with the brain in to show that you know, this is, it's about the, the creative ability of dyslexis um, and not just about the, the difficulty. And so to finish, I'd just like to share this with you. Some of you may know it already, but uh, I, I think it's fabulous. Um, it says, uh, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Um, you are a child of God, and you can take or leave the religious bit of it. That's, that's sort of either way. Um, your playing small doesn't serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. Hands up if you've ever seen a dyslexic child shine. Have you ever looked at a child and seen them shine? They do, don't they? You can see the ability with them, within them. Um, we were all meant to shine as children do. We were all born to manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us. It's within everybody. And as we let our light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we're liberated from our own fear, our present automatically liberates others. So basically, the, the, we must encourage creativity. We must encourage inspiration. We must inspire these individuals to be the best that they can. Part of how we do that is to be the best that we can and lead by example. So thank you all very much for your time. Thank you.